Chapter 1. Why Social Justice Matters Stop using that phrase, social justice, when you preach, the man steamed. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. He was a church leader, and he wanted to silence me on justice. The trouble is, I'm a bit of a rebel. So all this bad attitude did was make me read a pile of scripture on the next Sunday that demands we be people of justice. This man wasn't alone, though. When I speak on college campuses, at Christian conferences, or in churches, I know one phrase that always makes people squirm uncomfortably in their seat is social justice. People don't seem to mind the word justice. It's the social part that vexes them. That's a bit odd, because when the prophets like Amos or Isaiah or Moses or Jesus himself talked about justice, it was always social. Why do some flinch at the word, I wonder? Is it because we might actually have to do something tangible with our spirituality? Is it because we must speak up for or defend a population that we have been conditioned to be biased against? Is it because a political party or a news channel has told us this is an evil thing? Is it greed because we might have to share what we have with the poor or the immigrant? I wonder. The Christian community stands divided on the issue of spirituality and justice. Large camps of evangelicals have dug their heels into the ground on one side to say our gospel is not about social justice. On the other side of the line stand those who reject a gospel sans justice and demand options for the poor, a response to oppression, and a spirituality that embraces mercy. Does social justice matter? Is it critical to the life and growth of God's people after all? The answer from the Bible is clear. God is disturbed by injustice. He wants it stopped. And you are his plan for making things the way they're supposed to be. At the root of understanding the why of social justice are three foundational principles. The image of God, the common good, and the good news of Jesus. Image of God When we understand the idea of the Imago Dei, the image of God, as spoken from the opening lines of the garden story, we begin to understand justice. The concept of Imago Dei presented in Genesis makes clear that all people for all time have innate value, worth, and beauty because all people are made in the image of God. Some act as though this is a theological identity limited to those who call themselves Christians. It's not. The Imago Dei resides in every person who walks planet Earth. And because of this, every person has innate value and is worthy of equal dignity and respect regardless of race, gender, wealth, ethnicity, immigration status, background, or any other factor. Common Good Social justice is the reclaiming of God's original intent for humankind, to make the world a place where basic needs are met, people thrive, and there is shalom, peace with justice. One of our great godly responsibilities on earth is the remaking and healing of society so that all people, especially the disadvantaged and marginalized, can flourish. To do this, we must identify the root cause of poverty, hunger, and oppression, then give our lives our best ability and resources to changing those structures and practices that create discrimination and hunger, for example. Tribal people understand the common good and the power of collaboration. Liberians where I grew up say three rocks can cook rice. In other words, you cannot balance a pot over a fire on one rock or even two rocks. You need three rocks to hold the pot. They say this because everything in the village requires collaboration by the tribe. When rice is planted, one person does not plant the rice, not even two. When it's time to plant, the entire village comes to your farm to hoe and scatter seed because they know when the time comes to plant their farm, You will be there too. No one in the village plants alone, repairs their roof alone, or even makes mud bricks alone, or cries alone. The tension facing the church as we know it is that we have privatized our faith. Knowing God, for example, has become a personal decision. And sometimes we talk about personal quiet times as the pinnacle of spirituality. The problem is, when Jesus lays out the great command, He explains that the best form of spirituality is to care for your neighbor. All the inner pursuit of good is not the best we can do. Pursuing good for all is. 
In his brilliant voice in the conversation on justice, Walter Brueggemann describes Christian dispassion toward the common good as the great crisis among us. He explains that the disadvantaged live in a constant state of anxiety without justice, without peace. Social justice is good news. My experience is, when church people talk about the gospel, they infer a message that is preached, something to be spoken, and the evangelical has been good at this for the past 50 years. The trouble is, this is not the only way Jesus talked about good news. When we read his words in Matthew or Luke, we realize the gospel includes a clear doing component, feed the hungry, end oppression. So when Christians remain silent on issues of injustice, we minimize the good news as Jesus presented it. When Jesus talked about good news, it always included a social component of justice, healing, equality, and love. When we present a gospel as something that is only for our mind and heart, we have the gospel. We truncate it, and very often we make it something so ethereal it never changes the world we live in. I invite you to expand your idea of good news and see the whole gospel, something we speak as well as something we must do. The good news of Jesus includes social justice. There is simply no getting around that. You would have to tear pages out of your Bible to miss this. Today I see more and more Christ followers realizing the biblical value of social justice and how living out Jesus' commands to love the least and the last, share with the poor, are actually clear and often the best presentation of the good news. Sometimes I hear people say doing justice is a nice thing to do after we preach, or social justice is a nice way to attract people to the gospel. But that's just manipulation, cheap marketing of sorts. And it misses the point. Social justice is much deeper than an add-on or a marketing ploy. It is to be an intrinsic part of our identity in Christ. You cannot separate Jesus from justice. Read the miracle stories of the Gospels. Notice that Jesus never healed or gave dignity in order to trick someone into believing. Rather, someone was desperate, so he met the need. Following Christ Jesus requires a life intertwined with social justice. If we fail to do the good news, end prejudice, embrace the immigrant, for examples, then we are simply not living the Jesus kind of life. The Long Story of Christian Social Justice The story of social justice is long, stretching for centuries. The impression of some seems to be that social justice is either a nouveau trend of the next generation or a remnant of mid-20th century liberal theology. Not so. The story begins before Jesus, with ancient prophets like Amos, Isaiah, and Micah calling for justice and compassion for the poor. Jesus and the prophets took up the same call. Then 2,000 years ago, the first church shared all they had with each other and with the poor. By the 3rd century, Christianity was spreading wildly through the Roman Empire. So did the reputation of Christians as being the saviors of babies. At the time, Romans and pagans of all ethnicities widely practiced exposure, the abandoning of unwanted infants. Emphasize was an acceptable option for the poor who could not afford an extra mouth to feed, for the Romans who prized boys and despised unwanted baby girls, and for any parents with a child born with a deformity. Christians were different. Because Jesus loved children, they valued the infant and regularly rescued abandoned babies. The homes of Christians turned into safe havens, and the first monasteries became sanctuaries for unwanted babies and children. Of course, every child has heard of St. Nicholas, but what most do not know is that he was actually a 3rd century historical figure, often described as the first abolitionist. Nicholas served as the Bishop of Meyer in present-day Turkey and was widely known for being passionate about charity and social justice, caring for the neglected in his community, and being the protector of children. A story is told of one poor man with three daughters. The man would never have the required dowries for his daughters to marry, so they would certainly be sold into slavery. The story goes that St. Nicholas tossed a bag of gold through an open window into the poor man's house, enough money to save each girl from slavery. 
One bag landed in a stocking drying by the fire, of course. Much more recently, in the mid 19th century, when the American South was plagued by slavery, dozens of churches from Savannah to Detroit helped form the Underground Railroad, which carried slaves to freedom. This critical social justice movement, fueled primarily by Christians and churches, became a key factor in ending slavery. Compassion and generosity. Were prominent values among early Christian denominations, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Anglicans alike. The popular 18th century founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, famously instructed, Put yourself in the place of every poor man and deal with him as you would God deal with you. As a result of his influence, Methodists became leaders in many social issues of the day, including prison reform and abolishing slavery. My point is, in years past, the church actually led the way on social justice issues. However, in the 1920s, a disconnect grew when the modern evangelical movement began to swell. In reaction to the liberals who were building hospitals and schools, some chose a personal gospel over a Jesus kind of gospel. The focus turned highly individualistic. I have my personal quiet time, for example. The emphasis was on being saved from hell and making it into heaven after we die. The entire salvation process was internal, personal, transcendent, of the heart and soul to the exclusion of the world around. Growing up, I heard that caring for people's basic needs was for the Catholics and the liberals. Ironically, evangelicals are known for our reverence of the Bible, but we seem to have missed the parts of the Bible on which the theology of social justice is based. Like the part when Jesus' own brother James says, How can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Where we need to begin our gospel conversation is with Jesus, because Jesus was the embodiment of good news, and his life was the best demonstration. He kept saying, Follow my example, and we must.